Welcome to another museum FAQ video. I'm Paul Orselli, president and chief instigator at POW, Paul Orselli Workshop here on Long Island. And what a special treat to be joined today by Chip Lindsay, all the way from the wilds of Pittsburgh. Hi, Chip, how you doing? I'm well, thank you, Paul. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. So uh, Chip, I always like to start up before we launch into the main part of our conversation to give the guest or the guests a chance to talk about their background a little bit, because I always think that's interesting. Uh, so why don't you uh, give us a little bit about your background and uh, how you got from where you started to Pittsburgh? <laughs> Great. I, thanks. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, I, uh, you know, I, uh, somebody asked me how long I've been in the museum business, and that uh, that always surprises me because it seems like it hasn't been that long, but it's now decades. And um, and and really, my story. Uh, you know, I grew up in Fort Worth, uh, Texas, and um, the first time I ran across a museum, I remember it really distinctly because I was in second grade, and my mother said at the beginning of summer, "Oh, I signed you up for school," and I was like. I, you know, I, I just sort of figured out what summer was about. You know, it was not school. Um, and and uh, she had signed me up for a museum school at the Fort Worth Museum of Science and History. Um, it was a children's museum. And um, I became like uh, really passionate about, oh my gosh, these museums do really crazy things where you uh, get a chance to see the stuff of the world uh, or see the phenomena or, and I just remember I had this crazy, uh, a wonderful retired uh, school principal who was a science guy. And uh, I took a class called chemistry, really, uh, you know, crazy name. Um, but, uh, but at that moment, um, I realized how cool this was, you know, a little bit of talk about the periodic chart and all that, but then he disappeared in the back room and came out with this amber jar and pinched off a little piece of this silver stuff and said, let's go outside. Uh, so we went outside and the stuff burst into flame. And it was like, oh, phosphorus. So that's the, you know, so um, that was sort of my moment when I realized, oh, museums can be really special places. Um, I, I never forgot that. I took all the museum school classes I could uh, all through elementary school and then started volunteering when I was a teen. So I ended up spending, you know, going to this school, went to Texas and got my degree, but then I went back and got a full-time job at that museum and stayed there for 23 years. So I was in Fort Worth at the Museum of Science and History for a long time, a long time, a career's worth, right? Um, and then, uh, then kind of got itchy. Uh, it was time to find out what else was going on. Had a, had a stint at the Don Harrington Discovery Center in Amarillo, uh, Texas with Joe Hastings uh, from the Exploratorium. We were both sort of trying some crazy things at the same time. Lovely experience there, five years. Then I had a chance to run a science center at, uh, in Ashland, Oregon uh, and ran ScienceWorks uh, Hands-On Museum there for about five years. Um, and so in this way, I sort of have this trajectory that now I'm here in Pittsburgh and I've been here about five years, uh, four and a half years, but who's counting? Um, and, and really the nature of that, uh, that traveling around the country has made me really refine what it is that I'm looking for uh, uh, in, uh, in my work. Um, and, and I think the nature of, uh, well, what attracted me to Pittsburgh, I got here as fast as I could, was uh, Jane Werner's approach to this, this business. Um, it's, it's really a phenomenal, very, uh, uh, innovative and visionary way of thinking about museum. And I've learned a tremendous amount uh, while I've been here because uh, uh, because it, it strikes a chord, right? It's about the, the real stuff of the world, the real authentic ways of presenting it, of not um, varnishing it or poly coating it or putting it all in uh, primary colors, but actually being honest about it. And um, and then, and then um, I guess the other, the, the the wonderful thing that uh, is the icing on the cake is this opportunity to really look hard at it and do research on what it is that makes these kinds of spaces really special. Awesome. Well, you you uh, you started at a 
a children's museum in Fort Worth and through all the perambulations, you end up in a children's museum in Pittsburgh. That's awesome. It's kind of like, you know, I just can't, can't I just want to say Rosebud. No, that's, I'm that's great. Back, you know, that, well, and I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll just say uh, to uh, uh, cheer half of the viewers from Texas and antagonize the other half by saying that when I worked in Austin, people would always say that Fort Worth was where the West began and Dallas was where the East petered out. So <laughs> we'll just throw that in as a little Texas uh, color. And now we'll, there you are. So um, we, uh, I think uh, that's a great segue. You, you're talking about your career, but also giving a shout out uh, to Jane Werner in Pittsburgh. Um, the sort of, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it in a little bit about the Pittsburghian method uh, of the Children's Museum there, which is maybe a little bit different than a number of other museums, of course. But I want to talk first about the place that you are actually sitting in because you, you have a, there's like an interesting background and people might be wondering, well, where, where, where is Chip now? Like, where is San Diego? Where is Chip Lindsay? Where is Carmen San Diego? Where is Chip Lindsay right now? So where are you right now? Yeah, uh, this is um, the uh, Grable Gallery, the main uh, gathering point in uh, the newest addition to the Children's Museum campus called Museum Lab. Uh, it, it, uh, historically, it's, it's, it's the lovely um, building. It historically uh, was the first Carnegie uh, Free Public Library commissioned in the United States. Uh, so it was uh, opened its doors in 1890 to an audience of folks that, wow, free library. Uh, that was a novel concept. Um, and I guess in a way it was sort of it's the Google of its time, right? You could go there and people would help you find that, that whatever it is that you were looking for. Um, and uh, it remained a library for uh, uh, well up until the 70s. And then um, because of the cost of keeping up a building like this, and it had gotten a lot of deferred maintenance. It had, it had sort of fallen into disrepair. Uh, lightning struck the, the the clock tower, knocked the 500 uh, 500 pound chunk wow. of brick. Wow! Uh, and the head sounds like back. Said, sounds like Back to the Future. <laughs> very much like that. Uh, the head librarian called it quits and said, "We're going to build a place up the street. This is just too much." Uh, so it stayed vacant for a while. And again, um, uh, you know, a shout out to Jane Werner. She has this thing for old derelict buildings. I mean, first it was the Buell Science Center that became the first expansion of the Children's Museum. And now just the next one over is this beautiful 1890s Carnegie Library. Um, I, and, and, I, and, I, I empathize with that. I, I, I've had the opportunity to work in an, an old historic firehouse and an old historic set of airplane hangars and that. I think you can do really interesting things with uh, an old building. No, uh, it is. I mean, this is like the, you know, um, tantalizing, right? Yeah, um, it's just magnificent, magnificent spaces. And then these great architectural, uh, I guess you'd call it relics of uh, the former glory of it. And, uh, and the architect, um, Julie Eisenberg of Koenig Eisenberg in uh, Southern California, really had um, an approach, which was the beautiful ruin. Um, which was a, a lovely way of, of uh, bringing this place back, uh, exposing its bones, but not saying we're going to restore it because there wouldn't have been enough money in the world to restore this to the marble and uh, grandeur uh, millwork and everything that was in this place originally. Um, but, uh, but it does give you a sense of what the space was, uh, if you use your imagination a little bit, and also exposes the bones of the place, which are you know 1890s Pittsburgh so it's a lot of steel a lot of stone a lot of it's just it's just a lovely place to come through walk through imagine um, and then do some uh, do some interesting um, things uh, well let, let's let's talk about those things though because uh, a museum is not <laughs> well you I don't I think it's fair to say you and I wouldn't say a museum is just a building there might be some people who might think differently about that. So uh, now that you have this beautiful ruin and you have this as a canvas, what, what does that actually mean 
for the visitor experience in terms of exhibits and programming and of, of course utilizing the building like what what's so special about the lab chip <laughs> um yeah I, I guess the like the the um the, the quick elevator tagline for what is museum lab is uh it's a place for partnership um of, of organizations and uh it's also a platform uh, for uh, little bets, small bets in um, in uh, uh, the Venn diagram of school and museum. So on our second floor above us is uh, a middle school, Manchester Academic Charter School, uh, which has about 120 kids uh, when it's not the days of pandemic. Um, and uh, sixth, seventh and eighth grade. So they occupy, that's their home on the upper floor uh, when everything's in, uh, in full swing. This is like the lunchtime. So you'd have 120 kids coming down through this floor and out uh, to go eat lunch. And, um, and so there's this life force, this pulse that moves through the building. Um, on this floor, on the, on the museum floor, we have three studio spaces, three lab spaces that uh, one is a fine arts uh, lab space, one is a technology lab space, and the third is a making lab space. So each of those are, um, uh, are again, another a lab, a platform for, um, for creating projects, for creating ways of visitors, casual visitors that come in and go, what is this place? Uh, or for students to do prolonged uh, engagement with media, whether it's art or uh, tools or technology, um, to really sort of provide another outlet or another language for them to learn um, and then express themselves through. So um, it, it sets up some really interesting uh, dynamics because we're blending or trying to blend so uh, two things that a lot of times are kind of like oil and water, which is the formal system of school and the informal free choice learning of museum and trying to figure out those places where uh, you can have a handshake or you can have a, a, a deeper engagement or what is the overlap, Venn diagram overlap of those two really different cultures. Um, so um, I, I can go on and on. So well, no, I, I'm, <laughs> this is I'm happy. That's why I invited you. I'm happy to have you go on and on. But I, one thing that struck me, in addition, like you, 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 and the team there, obviously, uh, the entire team, uh, sort of set yourself. Um, I'm going to say two difficult challenges. You, you've articulated one. I mean, this dynamic between the the quote formal education system and the quote informal education system however you want to parse that but but you also have uh i think it's fair to say set out to capture <laughs> in the museum world the mythical unicorn of older visitors and so uh you know every every, uh, every children's museum says their audience is from birth to age pick an age 13 or 14 and I say, you're dreaming. So, um, or, or sometimes I say something even ruder, but let, let's just say that really most children's museums audiences are in the single digits. Let, let's, let's be a little bit honest about that. But uh, the lab, at least my perception is, um, you have deliberately set out to work with an older audience. So what does that really mean in practice or in the development process too? Yeah, uh, yeah, you, you, you- Oh, no pressure, no pressure. You know, it was funny because we, you know, we opened this place up in uh, April of 19 and kind of just got our feet underneath us and then had to close. So we've been closed longer than we've been open. So um, that aside, um, we, we've had a couple of uh, opportunities to really take a look. One, one of them was, uh, uh, w one of them was through the in Institute for Museum and Library Services grant, uh, an, a research practice partnership with Manchester Academic Charter School upstairs and the Children's Museum downstairs um, to really look at how is it that we can uh, understand and build a relationship uh, between the two staff, uh, two staff so that, um, so that the students benefit, crazy idea. Um, and that's been going for a while. Of course, the pandemic has interrupted uh, our normal flow of that a bit. Um, but the, yeah, 
like like we all haven't been interrupted um, on every level. Uh, the nice thing about it is that it gave us a little breathing room to really try some things out. And, um, and now with the pandemic, we have other opportunities to, um, to try some smaller projects. So now at this point, we're trying to get our teaching artists and museum staffers paired up with, um, with one of the uh, uh, classroom instructors upstairs um, to work with students to co-generate a project. Um, that feels really good because um, at that point you're getting the voice of the students, um, which is a, 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 a purchase on that interchange between the formal and informal. Because what we've got on this floor is stuff that's too dangerous, too messy, too expensive for the typical classroom teacher to have access to. We've got it. Uh, or if we don't have it, we're happy to talk about how, how we can figure it out. Um, but then um, but then what we're discovering is, uh, this is my favorite part of this, we've been doing the after school program for that same age group in on this floor. Some of the kids from Max are part of that after school program. And what we found is that, um, is that they're like leading the way, like telling their teachers, hey, you know, they've got this stuff down here that could work great for, and then also chiding us saying, you know, they're doing a unit on. Um, and so the students that, that hard to reach age group is actually teaching us some things. Well, because you, you've given them autonomy and you've given them a, a, an actual voice in the experience. They're not just a passive uh, recipient of the museum and the teacher's experience and largesse. They, they actually truly are uh, a partner, a creative partner in the process, which is great. Yeah. Well, just think some of those, some of those students are gonna replicate your story that you started out with here. You know, they're, they're gonna, somebody is gonna be interviewing them on some neuro connected YouTube future thing. And they're gonna say, yeah, I was in the middle school in the museum lab and here I am working now as a educator or an exhibits person or a director or what what have you. Well, that's that's awesome. I, I um, you you know that I and everyone watching this is just that much more excited to come visit when the coast is clear, as they say, but uh, we so this will be an added incentive to people. But, you know, I wanted, we talked about before we started recording, and I mentioned a little bit at the beginning of this video, the um, Pittsburghian method, that's that's my designation. But there there is something a little different, I'd say, about the Children's Museum uh, in Pittsburgh. Um, you know, every, I, I was, always warn my kids when they say, well, I'm unique. And I say, well, so is everyone else in the world, technically. So, um, you know, they, they, it's, it's fair to say that every museum is unique, but maybe there is something a, a little bit uniquer <laughs> about what's going on in Pittsburgh. And I, I think, um, uh, although she might be embarrassed by us saying this, but we'll, we'll, I'm happy to invoke Jane Werner's name again. And, uh, you know, I think many people who work in the museum business realize that for good or bad, the, the people at the top of the org chart have a, have, a, have a lot to say about what happens and how money gets spent and which projects get approved. So th there's that, but I'm wondering um, from your perspective, not, not only um, with your work developing the museum lab, but also since you are working cheek to jowl with the rest of the campus, and it truly is a campus there in Pittsburgh. I'd be interested, not to put you on the spot, but I am putting you on the spot, like what, what you might say about what I maybe have inartfully coined as the Pittsburghian Children's Museum method. Yeah, uh, so uh, this could be like a whole other segment first off, because there's a lot there. Put a, put a bug, put a bug in some of your coworkers ears. We can do multiple uh, interviews all at once. So. Well, yeah, I mean, honestly, uh, there's uh, I, you know, there's like three people that you should really be talking to. Um, 
uh, I'll give you a, I'll give you an overview uh, from my perspective. Um, I mean, one of the things that attracted me to the Children's Museum was the work of uh, Lisa Brahms and her Department of Learning and Research here at the Children's Museum at the time. Now she wait, wait. I'm going to give give a shout out for Dr. Lisa Brahms. Woo! As well, you should. Um, she's she, we, she's got a lot of fans, um, and. Uh, and what she was able to do is really uh, take a look at um, the habits of mind that people have when they're making and, and really uh, define that for the Children's Museum, but it has ramifications uh, for, for the field, right? Because if we can figure out uh, her technique, which is brilliant, of coming alongside practitioners in the field and watching what they're doing and and then later on saying, you know, I noticed that when you had that family group, you did this thing where you, and then unpacking that um, and talking about it. And then uh, the practitioners become, uh, oh, that was important, I guess. Yeah, it was totally important because then, oh, so it's this sort of appreciative inquiry into the practice that we all engage in on the museum floor that like Modesto Tamez at the Exploratorium says, it's like jazz, right? You, you know, you, you don't know what's gonna happen. You just sort of plan the space in between you and the visitor and you don't know what they're bringing. They don't know what you're bringing and you've got to, and uh, it's true that every engagement in a museum environment is gonna be different because the people that you're, you don't know if you speak the same language. You don't know how old they're gonna be. You don't know if they're gonna stay five minutes or two hours. I mean, all of those things. But Lisa was able to sort of capture um, the essence of that in the learning and research role that she had here. Now she's doing it in Montshire in Vermont, which is, uh, she's continuing that work. Um, but that's what attracted me here. But what's kept me here is exactly what you said about Jane and her leadership and Anne Fullenkamp and her approach to uh, exhibit design, another person you should talk to. Um, because uh, there's been, there's some things that are like, the stakes in the ground that are the generative structure that make the Children's Museum of Pittsburgh really different. One is something that Jane says is that we're really not a children's museum. We're a cultural institution that's good for kids. So it's really looking at, so what is the realm that we wanna be working in? Um, knowing that art is really a key element of our content area and then design is also part of our content area um, and so if you're doing this and having a cultural institute of, about art and design that's also good for kids um, it means that you are understanding a fundamental truth that children are really aesthetic creatures right they're wide open they sense so many things that we as adults don't see anymore. We've got the filters up. We've got our squelch turned way up and we don't see stuff anymore. But kids see the texture on things. They see the subtleties and colors. They smell the spaces. They, they're they wide open to all the experiences that we as adults they, are kind they, of- They smear mud and paint all over themselves if they want to. <laughs> uh, all of that. Um, and, and so if you really understand that and you honor them as learners, then you're gonna spend just as much time thinking about good design and good art because kids really get it. Um, and, uh, you know, Anne says this thing, I think it's true. She, uh, she says, you know, we sometimes uh, do primary colors and gel coat, you know, like Technicolor everything, uh, do primary colors because kids need to know primary colors. Um, and it may be misguided sort of thinking from a design perspective that maybe the adult is trying to, re to recapture what the world was when they were a child um, and not realizing that they don't need to do that. You know, that the texture of wood is actually really lovely. And if you're a child, you pay attention to it or the texture of a uh, stone or the texture of um, everything. Um, and so good design is good for all ages, but especially for kids. Um, and good art is good for everybody, especially kids. Um, so like in the, uh, the gallery that we just changed out, I was, uh, one of the teaching artists said, you know, it's in the gallery with the Warhols. And I was like, what? Yeah, the gallery that has the three Warhols in it. I was like, Warhols, really? Yeah, yeah, they're original Warhol prints that are on the wall. Oh, 
I'm going to have to go look now. I, every kid in the world. I know that gallery. Right? <laughs> um, but it's that, it, that's, that's some of the things that make this place so special. And, and the other bit, um, the other bit that I'll just say is that, I mean, forever our t-shirts on the back said, play with real stuff or create with real stuff. And so if you have a gallery that you've got six year olds in and they're doing acrylic painting, they're going to be using real brushes, not throwaway brushes, not crap brushes, really good brushes. Or if they're working with clay, they're going to be working with real clay that a ceramicist would use because it feels good and you could do so many more things with it. So they deserve to be using the real stuff or in, in make shop, you know, it would be like, we're going to give them a soldering iron and we're going to see how, how well they, if they have, if they have good understanding of how to use this tool, then they, they can speak with that tool in ways that we can't predict. Um, and we just have to watch their parents because typically the parent is the one that grabs the soldering iron from the wrong side because they weren't paying attention. Um, but trusting, uh, trusting that your learners are interested um, and then respecting them enough to give them the real stuff of the world that, that word, that word respect is an important word in this conversation. I mean, it, it, it's respecting your visitors, like giving kids real stuff and, and sort of by extension, maybe helping the adults there recapture some of that lost sensory awareness or, you know, w w wonder in the world that, uh, you know, way back when in second grade, when they took that Fort Worth Museum class, you know, that, that that's, that's there. Well, I, um, I certainly have um, enjoyed this conversation as always, Chip, always wonderful to see you and speak with you. I think we have um, made a good made a good recommendation for people to visit both Fort Worth and Pittsburgh. So that, that's highly recommended by both of the people on this video, Fort Worth and Pittsburgh for all sorts of reasons. And um, I think uh, it was just great to, to see you by video. And uh, as I said, this is an added incentive to come visit in Pittsburgh and see what you are all, all up to and see the newest part of the campus, the museum lab, that, that will be awesome. So thanks, thanks so much, Chip, for taking the time. Absolutely. Rumor has it Aztec 2022 is going to be here. So I hope so. I hope so. I'm, I'm, uh, I, I'll certainly have, even in the erratic system, have had my vaccinations by then. So I, I, I think uh, <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that's a good, that's a good sign. Thanks. Thanks again, Chip. Great Ask to out. see you. Be safe. Yeah, I know. We're, we're, we're both. We're both. <laughs> Thanks, Paul.